the definition of the concept of exposure is quite wide. It's probably a little bit more than what we normally think. And if you look at the various types of exposures people have with uh, toxins in the environment and at the workplace, uh, there is quite a bit of overlap, but nevertheless, these are the classical categories of exposures. I guess at the very top of the list, and probably causing the greatest impact overall, rightfully so, are the so-called personal exposures, the things we choose to expose ourselves to, like uh, drugs, like alcohol, like tobacco, as well as the substances which we uh, take uh, through medical necessity, medications. There's a whole uh, area of outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, industrial exposures, which overlap with the agricultural hazards, natural toxins, and even things like radiation and physical injury can be regarded as exposures in that we have our bodies in the environment and we get exposed to these various things. And this is going to be the main brunt of this chapter. At the very, very top of the list, and of course, by far the most preventable cause of death in the United States is a personal exposure, a personal choice called tobacco. I guess by uh, a good definition, it's not a choice because like most other addictions, these are things that the person really has no control over. Uh, Nicotine is uh, an addicting substance, so I'm not too sure how strong the word choice really matters in this. There's about a half a million premature deaths in the United States from tobacco. Its main effects are in cancer, respiratory diseases, and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, it has a tremendous, therefore, cost in uh, uh, health-related costs, estimated $150 billion. You know, these numbers might not seem very big these days, considering with some of them that have been thrown around during the election here. But uh, it's a single most preventable cause of death <coughs> in the United States. And even though we all know, and the industry has always known for many, many years, it is a cause of lung cancer. 70% of all lung cancers are caused by tobacco. About a third of all other cancers are related to tobacco as well. So we have to keep that in mind, and especially things like uh, bladder, urinary tract. Um, these are all have a very, very strong relationship to the substances found in the tires. Remember, it's the nicotine that gets you hooked. And it's the tires that does the damage. What are the compounds? Well, often the generic term polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon is thrown out. Sometimes they'll throw out little acronyms like NNK and NNN, standing for things which will take you a half hour to pronounce. Remembering that polonium, the isotope polonium-210, is also a significant carcinogen as well, independent of the polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and the NNNs and NNKs. So let's take a look. In the lung, of course, all substances play a part, as well as in the upper respiratory tract. In the esophagus, the N prime nitrosonor nicotine is a very, is the, the single most uh, indicted causative agent. In the pancreas, NNK. And I'm going to try to pronounce that for you. And I know I'm not going to uh, get it correct, but NNK is 4 methyl nitrosoamino 1 3 pyridyl 1 butanone. Okay, I think I did it. In the bladder, the naphthalamines from tobacco smoke, from the tires, uh, pay, play a very, very strong role. In the oral cavity, generally the same compounds as in the uh, lung and upper respiratory tract. Also, uh, it's almost, it's probably not even worth separating these. If you just remember the uh, polycyclic, polycyclic hydrocarbons, NNK, NNN, polonium, basically have roles 
in uh, cancers of the lung, upper respiratory tract, GI, urinary tract, and these are the main uh, uh, cancers. To give you an even more scary diagram, which I have uh, tried to decaffeinate for you, if you look at all of these data here, it represents risk factors with a little bit of difference between men and women. But if the thing you want to take home from this uh, careful study is that if you want to generalize, uh, smokers have a threefold risk of atherosclerosis relative to non-smokers. They have a tenfold risk of emphysema. And they have a twenty-fold risk of lung cancer. And if you take the other types of cancers which are not classically lung, uh, that varies from about three to tenfold. So once again, as we said before, the main effects of uh, cigarette smoke is on uh, blood vessels, lung, and uh, a neoplasm. In the workplace, cigarettes have an important role, especially with regard to secondhand smoke. A lot of people are concerned with secondhand smoke, and there's a lot of confusing studies. And I just want to take, uh, give to you the uh, the undisputable facts. Uh, to try to clear up a lot of the baloney we hear about secondhand smoke. We hear studies uh, estimating widely what the risks are, but the, the generally agreed upon uh, uh, conclusion is that uh, there is a measurable and statistical increase in risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, but rather than being a four to tenfold risk, which we saw for the uh, smoker themselves, it's probably less than twofold, okay? It's in the range of, oh, maybe 50, 60, 70 percent, but definitely it's not nearly as high. It's approximately one-tenth as high as the smoker himself, and that probably makes sense, but it's still statistically uh, right there. And of course, in the workplace, uh, if you take the work-related lung diseases, pneumoconioses, uh, s exposures to silica, coal, dust, cigarette smoke tremendously exacerbates those conditions. So workers who are at risk for uh, lung diseases are uh, tremendously exacerbated by the presence of cigarette smoke as well. Those are the two things you should kind of take home with you. And let's talk about the single next biggest Ex personal exposure, which we'll probably spend the most amount of time on, and uh, we'll talk about alcohol. Prox uh, the statistics always appear that there's about 1 in 10 people that we know are alcoholics. That's a, a, a good rule of thumb. Uh, because we all know somebody or have somebody in our family or some close friend or the the social and medical diseases that alcoholism produces always reflect on the close people around them. And alcohol is directly responsible for about 100,000 deaths a year. Not quite as big as uh, tobacco, but still pretty big. And it also has an economic loss about the same as uh, tobacco, mostly because of uh, absenteeism and work-related uh, issues about an economic loss of about $130 billion a year. Now, you'll probably spend the rest of your life trying to decide what is an alcoholic. Uh, and you're going to hear all kinds of crazy stories. But uh, that decision is ultimately going to be yours. I'm not going to try to define it for you. I personally think that I can't think of anybody who drinks more than two drinks a day uh, that is not an alcoholic. That's my personal opinion. But it has more of a social definition rather than just a quantity definition. And very often when you go to talks where alcoholism is discussed, you'll always ha have the little statistic. Well, you know, there's a million studies showing that if you have a little bit of uh, alcohol that's good for you. Well, let me tell you, the only thing I could think of that a little bit of alcohol does lead to more alcohol. So whenever I hear this little statistic thrown in, I always know that's a drinker that's presenting the uh, data. And uh, let's drop it at that. And once again, as we said, somewhere along the line, 
in your life, hopefully sooner rather than later, you're going to understand the definition of alcoholism. I thank you very much.